Oh, I'm sure are glad we're all family here. <laughs> I miss Tom. You know, he knows how to count. I have not a clue. Uh, I've always said that we don't know the end of the world because uh, uh, preachers don't know how to add up. So, except Mr. Camping, uh, and he's wrong. Uh, well, he hasn't been proved wrong yet. <laughs> Anyway, we are uh, in Romans, and uh, uh, we are talking about making over our lives. Um, we have lots of makeover shows in the world, and, uh, and this is just another uh, one, but this one is important and, and uh, is making us over from the inside out. Lee Strobel is a, um, a writer, was a journalist for years and years in one of the Chicago newspapers. Uh, until he wrote an article about whether Christianity could be proven, uh, whether the resurrection could be proven. And, and so he started looking into this, and, and, uh, and during his research, he becomes a believer, uh, quite amazingly so, and then has written a number of books on uh, the case for the cross and the case for the resurrection and, and a, a number of other uh, books that he's put out. One day he was flying uh, home to Midway Airport. Most of us are familiar with O'Hare Airport in, in Chicago. But he was flying home to Midway Airport uh, in Chicago. And it was sitting next to a, a gentleman from India. And they had gotten to talking over the, in, during the flight. And um, they had talked about what was going to happen when they landed. And this Indian gentleman said, well, I'm going to get off the plane. I'm going to get on a bus, take the bus all the way across town to O'Hare Airport, and in O'Hare Airport, my, my wife and kids are going to come and, and meet me there and pick me up and take me home. <laughs> Strobel's going, what, 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 wait a minute. Uh, you know, I have a car here at the airport. Why don't I just take you up to O'Hare? And in, the Indian gentleman is, is kind of stunned by this. He says, well, why would you do that? And Strobel replied, uh, he asked, has anyone ever done something so kind to you that it makes you want to go and pass a kindness along to someone else. And he used that to talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ has been kind to us in ways we do not deserve. Before we could ever possibly make any difference uh, in, in appeasing God, God, I mean, uh, God has blessed us. Uh, and so we pass that along, and that is why Paul is constrained to preach the gospel, which we talked about last week. This particular section, verses 16 and 17, begin with a conjunction, the word for. Um, and that connects it to the previous verses. And so Paul is saying, I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, because, that for, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He wants to go and preach to them. He wants to share with them the good news because that good news has been shared with him because he is not ashamed of what God has told him. The argument of these verses sort of follows a, a stair-step pattern. And it goes like this. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, he wants to come and talk to them uh, because the reason for that is the gospel is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes. And he says, it's the power of salvation to those who believe, first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. And then he says, the reason for that is, uh, why it is the power of God for salvation is because it, it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. And he says, in a gospel of righteousness from God, uh, that righteousness is by faith from first to last. He is following up on this key word, gospel. Gospel is just a, uh, should be translated, and the word means good news. Paul briefly explains why he is so committed to sharing that good news. He has gone all over the world. He has been put in jail. He has been uh, beaten. He's been whipped. He's been stoned. He's been persecuted. He's had everything done to him that could possibly seem to me like it happened to a guy. But he is committed to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, that could just mean that he, he wants to say, I'm very proud of the gospel. You know, it just might add a little punch to his phrase. But it seems to have more than just that. 
it seems to, he seems to have a reason for saying that. And the reason might be uh, found in chapter 3, where it says that there are some people there who have deliberately misunderstood what he has been saying. They have, they have not really caught on to, to exactly what this ministry has, and so they've been slandering him. Uh, he knows that he's come under fire for this idea that God loves everybody just the way they are and accepts people just the way they are. They don't have to obey the law in order to please God to be accepted by him. God loves them just the way they are. One of the reasons why he writes this long and theological letter is because there have been people who have misunderstood, either deliberately or, or not deliberately, misunderstood what he has been saying, and he wants to correct those opinions. And frankly, I think this is one of those great illustrations that God can take people's uh, sinfulness and produce something good out of it. Because if these people hadn't complained about Paul, hadn't misunderstood what he was saying, we would have never had the book of Romans. But God could say, I'm going to use those slander, that, all those lies that people were telling about Paul, and I'm going to produce something good out of it. And this book is what we have. He says he's not ashamed. Well, why isn't he ashamed of the gospel of Christ? He says because he knows that this gospel, this good news, is good news. Why would a person be ashamed of being a fireman and rushing into a house and saving a person in a burning building? Why would you be ashamed if you were a doctor and you did surgery to save a person's life? And the same thing is true of a Christian. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it's good news. He is saving lives through this gospel. And it's salvation for the whole world if people will believe in it. So he preaches this gospel. Salvation is a very important word to Paul. Uh, salvation and the, and the word save are used many times uh, in the book of Romans. And it's one of his key ideas. We sometimes use the language of salvation to just talk about that initial step. Uh, when were you saved? What day was that? When did you come to know the Lord? Uh, and we oftentimes just talk about that moment. But Paul actually does the opposite. He usually talks about the end of the process. He normally uses the word saved when he talks about a person's death and going in, into heaven or when he talks about the second coming. So he was talking about being saved at that last day, being saved from the very presence of sin, being saved from all of our temptations to sin, being saved from, from the penalties of sin. He's talking about the end of the process more often than he's talking about the beginning. And maybe we should have that emphasis as well. You know, yeah, it is a great thing. That day that you, be, that day that you became a, a believer. It's a great thing that you became, a, you know, uh, accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior years ago. But it is going to be a much bigger, better thing <laughs> when we finish the process, when we have walked all of our days and we walk into the presence of the Lord. And we need to talk about those days when we see the hands that were, uh, took the nails for us. Paul insists that salvation is available to everyone who believes. He wants the Romans to know that it's not just for Jews. It is for Carpathians and Gauls and Vandals, not the Vandals who spray paint walls, uh, but the Vandals that came from Germany and the Huns and everyone. The gospel is available to everyone who believes. The Old Testament focused on Israel. That was God's tool at that time to show how he wanted people to live, how he wanted people to believe, how he wanted people to, to interact with him, how they could have a relationship with him. And so, you know, it focused on, on, the, Old Test, on, on the Jews. This, and Paul says this gospel is first for the Jew. Now, some people think that this is just a historical thing. It's just a timeline thing. You know, yeah, Jews heard about it first. Then now we hear about it. We go on from there. But I think Paul has more in mind than just that. I don't think Paul is done with the Jews. Or I don't think God is done with the Jews. In some sense, Jews still have some sort of priority in this plan of salvation. Now, if that bothers you, you need to remember that in, in the economy of God, in the plan of God, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So maybe that reverses itself when we get to heaven. 
But God has said that the Jews have some sort of priority, and I'm, I'm defending.